started. Um, I think the way we want to start is to start at the beginning, and we'll start with all the panelists introducing themselves. Hey y'all, I'm Chris Kindred. Um, I'm making nonfiction, uh, well, right now I'm making nonfiction comics um, generally about social issues. You can find a lot of that work over at The Nib, um, uh, slash Chris dash Kindred. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, pronouns are he and his, and yeah, ready to start this panel. I'm Yasmin Omar Ada. I'm a comics artist and game designer, um, a Middle Eastern and agender, so when you address me, please use they, them. Um, my work really focuses on coping with illness and understanding identity. Most recently, I have a book coming out, Mish Adra, which is about my experiences with epilepsy. Um, I'm Sloan Leung. Uh, I've worked in comics since I was like a teen. I'm working on a graphic novel right now called Map to the Sun that's about girls, basketball, it's like slice of life. Um, yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> um, I'm Tilly Walden. Uh, I'm a cartoonist from Austin, Texas. I have published a few books uh, with Avery Hill Publishing, a small publisher in London, and uh, I guess my other book just came out, uh, Spinning from First Second, a graphic memoir about my 12 years as a competitive figure skater. Um, and yes, uh, she, her pronouns. Thank you. And so which pronouns would you like? Uh, she, they, her. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. And hi guys, I'm J. A. Michaelin. I'm a I do lots of things. I'm a critic. I'm an editor, and I like to talk to people. So this is my first time moderating a panel. So hopefully I do okay. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, so to open up to you guys, I think the first thing um, we want to talk about, and just in general for this panel, you were in an architecture page that's up there, just to make sure you're in the right place. And um, we wanted to talk about layouts. We wanted to talk about the emotions behind layouts um, and some inspiration stuff. So we can start out with, um, you know, what's on what's on your guys' mind when you, you know, create your layouts, when you architect your pages? Um, what goes through your mind? What are the things that are important to you? What do you think about? Oh yeah, sure. Um, uh, with my nonfiction work, well, I guess like where my head is at in comics now, um, I'm really attracted to fixed units that is more like uh, every panel would be the same size and. Um, just like looking to establish a rhythm through a grid. So that way I can have a tighter control over um, the heavy emotional beats or whatever kinds of moments I might want to rhyme. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about just like establishing rhythm. And also I'm the type of cartoonist who will get really neurotic <laughs> if you give me just like a page. So I have to have some structure in my life. <laughs> Um, it's funny because, like, um, for me, it's almost the opposite. Mm -hmm. I have to relay a lot of abstract information, like how it feels to have a seizure and, like, what anxiety feels like and things like that. So a lot of my layouts just tend to be less focused about, uh, like, relaying dialogue and, like, relaying, like, what, what people are, like, used to seeing information and more, like, relaying really abstract information. So when I start out with a page, like, I have to, like, really, uh, like, form it in a really abstract way in order for that to come across. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, for me, the paneling is part of the drawing. Um, I'm, I just don't do things like uh, uh, Frank Santoro's here, and he has a really strong philosophy on layouts, like just like plugging in images to different grids, where I'm drawing, uh, like roughing and paneling and drawing at the same time, and I don't work ahead, so the story really dictates uh, how everything looks on the page to me. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like I'm kind of a combination of both of you because I. I am really drawn to grids. I love the order of it, but at the same time, I feel like a grid is kind of a living thing, and that even though it's something structured, it should respond to the content. And whenever I'm thinking about layouts, I'm thinking about the layout as as really like a reaction to what the content of that page. And so I've done, I've started to experiment more. Well, I'll have a grid, and just you know, the smallest thing where it'll shift just a little bit. You know, the, the one of the lines that goes through it will just curve, or as you know, the action gets more intense, the grid will really start to kind of mix around. And I think because I'm so drawn to both grids and uh, more abstract type of layouts, I'm, tr I'm searching for a balance between those two. And I think that's, that's an interesting space to operate. Uh, yeah, I think the idea of a, like panels as a living thing, I think is like, super cool, actually. I never thought about it that way. And I think that more people should subscribe to that because I think a lot of the problem with comics is people don't think about their layouts and like it's not really something that's like given as much attention as I think I should because it's so important like for the mood and I think 
it being a living thing is such an important analogy. Yeah. And I think, oh, sorry, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. I'll say, I think Sloan and I, we both are like really attracted to like more like abstract and fluid imagery. And so like, it's we have like a similar style where like the story is what makes the layout evolve. Yeah. It's really interesting that you bring that up because um, I like uh, fluid, um, like, if you've seen any of my illustration work, then I like to, I guess, inject as much motion or action as possible. Um, but when it comes to comics, I feel sometimes like I'm a little confined, so I guess that grid provides mm -hmm. that contrast, mm -hmm. or kind of like a bottle for the lightning. Um, but yeah, I don't know, it's, it's really weird. And um, yeah. Well, it's <laughs> like, it's funny because uh, I feel the same way about like illustration and comics. Like, it is totally different to draw an illustration from just like a, from a comic that has a grid. Right. Like, even like a splash page for a comic still has like a different vibe. And like, your brain is almost in a different place because you don't have like that structure. So, it, it's funny, like, your styles can be so fluid in between like a spot illustration and like a page because your brain is just in a different place working in that grid. Yeah. So, I, I totally feel that. It's like how it is with me, too. I feel like fundamentally what, and tell me if you guys think about this too, but so much about layouts is just about thinking about the whole page and not just about the panels. And it's so easy to get hung up on like that dialogue in the third panel or that one face in the fifth panel. And you're just like, you can get really wrapped up in your own narrative and in your own, in your own story. And, and I think that can take away from your layouts. And when you stop and look back at your page as a whole, at the flow and how, how it relates to the page it's next to, or if it's a web comic, how it, how it flows on a scroll, every, you know, what your, what your format is and what your page is, how those work together, just thinking about that can do so much for it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think it's super important for it to, and like it's funny too because like uh, sometimes if you're like aware of that being a thing, you can also subvert it. Mm -hmm. Like one of my favorite manga artists, Hajime Ueda, who did the FLCL manga. If any y'all are like fully Cooly fans, uh, he does this thing where like he'll have the entire pages like laid out for like some like random stuff, and then the most important information is like in the tiniest panel with the most dialogue. <laughs> And like, it's like, it's one of those things where like you can tell he's doing it on purpose to subvert it. And I think it's like a really interesting move. And that can only come from like the idea of really thinking about the page is like such an important part of it. And then just completely just crumpling up and throwing it away. Mm -hmm. So that's cool in and of itself, yeah. I think. I think you guys, I mean, just riffing off of what um, you're saying, Yasmin, I'm interested in intention. Because you're pointing out that like this artist is doing something, and it's obvious that they're doing it on purpose. Mm -hmm. And it seems like kind of the undercurrent of a lot of what you guys are talking about is creating layouts with intention. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it, I think all four of you do that. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about intention and and you know how it reflects in the work, or maybe not? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, whenever I'm working on, say, uh, a more journalistic comic, um, objectivity in journalism is kind of bullshit, but. Um, <laughs> but I can give the illusion of objectivity if I fix the most of these ca uh, panels. Most of these comics are scroll, so um, those fixed units really help a lot. Um, just those static panels, um, kind of it, it relays information really matter of factly, so um, that helps a lot. I, when it comes to intention for my layouts, I'm always. Uh, thinking about the underlying emotion in a scene. And this is this is random, but it made me think of it. Some really good advice I got from a writer was that with every scene, there should be an, an emotional change. And if you're working on a story, write out your scenes and say, they're starting this scene feeling jealous, and they end the scene feeling blank. But that's a whole other conversation. My point being that I, you know, in a, in a scene, sure, someone could be running through a forest, but that in it itself doesn't define my intention with the layout. It's how it feels to run through a forest. Not just that you're running through a forest, but that maybe running through a forest feels really overwhelming and chaotic and big. And so I really try and think about making a layout that fully encompasses that experience. Because that's, I mean, you're, it, you're creating pages that people are going to read and take in. And it's not just about your writing and your drawing, but how you're putting those two together and how you're putting them on the page is also part of your story. Yeah. Yeah, even like right now I'm working on like a basketball scene and I've really had to like open up the paneling so a lot of the panels will actually like stipple off into like oh, nothingness. Like yeah, Ooh. it's very shoujo <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and just like a lot of like harsh diagonals to like indicate like 
harsh movements and quick movements and so yeah my story and like the emotions happening just dictate it like panel by panel for me and then um yeah I kind of like press it compress it all into a page you know um but yeah there's so many things that you can do like even the texture of your panel lines is another way to convey you know e even just like a totally different timeline or to signal that it's like a flashback or yeah, right. yeah, totally. yeah. <laughs> black panels um, yeah. <laughs> also, uh, it's really cool that you mentioned um, that y'all like brought up the idea of emotion um, influencing panels because I think about how that influences the drawing itself, um, where you might have because of those uh, because you're working off what it feels like, um, you you're not as tied to the technical aspects. And I know for a lot of younger artists and myself included, um, that can be a huge hangup. You know, sometimes you can forego perspective, or sometimes you can forego um, just like just like. Uh, realism and yeah I don't know it's I'm really cool really glad you made that point because like I have such a thing where it's like okay everyone you know you kind of know like the rule of thirds it's like your panel should be structured quote unquote so you have like the pages divided up into thirds and you have three rows and I think it's important to learn that but I'm a huge believer in like learn the rules but then like frick the rules like <laughs> learn them first and then break them if you want to because i think that's kind of how you can tell like i was bringing up an example where it's like oh this person's subverting this idea on purpose mm -hmm. and you can tell that because you can tell like oh this person learned the rules and they're just like okay like i i know them and then i'm gonna break them and i'm gonna have fun with it and i think it's way more fun and way more purposeful when you learn like those technical aspects and that can be kind of hard for younger artists but it's like just get through it and then once you do you're gonna have so much fun just being like oh I'm not gonna do that <laughs> I think that's we've all been talking about the grid and you mentioned Frank Santoro I think grids are like so healthy for learning the craft of comics I, I don't know if you guys agree it's just like if you it's layouts are really fun and we're probably all in a point now where playing with layouts is really fun but like a few years ago by by forcing myself to always put my comics in either a six panel or a nine panel grid, I, I realize now how much that helped me learn because it really made me focus. And then you're right, learn the rules and break it. So learn the grid, understand the grid, understand flow, and then break it. Actually, would you say what, uh, On the Sunbeam was like a huge exercise in breaking that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I shotgunned it like a month ago. And oh, did you? <laughs> and this is my webcomic, by the way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I was really, I was really, um, I guess, like, amazed by how frequently you broke, um, you know, like how you, not only you broke the structures, but how they, um, uh, work with scrolling. But, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think if you're making a comic for the web, it should absolutely be built for that. You know, it's so important. Um, and yeah, I really, in my web comic, it started off not gridded, but sort of living in this three-tier space. And I realized at a certain point that I had been drawing a lot of smoke in this comic, just a lot of a lot of clouds, a lot of sky, a lot of smoke. And I realized, like, why am I leaving this element just in the panels? This should influence the panel. So I started to kind of base layouts on how smoke curls. And then it just, yeah, it's like I realized that I was really enjoying doing this and that it suited the comic, so I just like ran with it. So if you read the comic, you see that moment where, where I realized like, oh yeah, I wanna do this, this is good. And that's like really exciting, like watching like an artist's growth, like watching, like, and it's like, yeah, like, like you're saying, like learn the stuff first, and then like you start to realize like, oh, I can do this and I can do that. And you can, if you follow someone's work, you can see the point where they kind of realize that, and I think that's really valuable. Is this the part where we talk about TJ Kubo? <laughs> we can. Uh, well, I'm just going to make a quick footnote. I have more stuff on him later, but um, yeah, like you see him get comfortable in early bleach, and then like I guess before before the filler arcs came in, um, <laughs> classic. You, you see him playing with like really sleek design, and also incorporating type, um, and also negative space. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll gush about that later. But yeah. that's like interesting too because a lot of manga artists work on a really tight crunch mm -hmm. and yeah. it's yeah it's really hard to come up I think with those creative layouts in such a short amount of time so like it's very like I respect that a lot and also without it, without it looking like a cop out exactly yeah. yeah totally I like you mentioned negative space I, we haven't really talked about it yet but I, I remember when I had the realization that you can learn about layouts and put all this stuff in it, but then you can also take stuff out. And in a way, you have to learn to take things out, too, or learn to get rid of borders. It's like, mm -hmm. that's a whole, you can push yourself in both directions. But have you guys explored negative space or 
What have you, I don't know, I'm curious. Um, yeah, I guess if I could get a visual yeah. right about now, maybe I could talk about that a bit sure. more. <laughs> that was not planned. <laughs> <laughs> Is this um, the one? So that's a, like a page where it's like, okay, this is a pretty typical layout. It's like, we got some information. There's like a little bit of action going on or whatever. Like trying to convey like basic information. But if I could get next after that. Um, this one on the right is me trying to describe how a certain particular kind of seizure that I have has. It's non-convulsive and it's really hard to kind of convey like when I'm in the space, when I'm having the seizure, my brain just feels like in it's a different dimension. And what kept coming to mind is like my brain feels like it's slightly to the left of whatever reality we're in. And I was like agonizing. I'm like, how the hell am I gonna get this across? And what I did is I decided to take a page that I would normally have with panels and tilt the panels to the side. So now you can see that the character is outside of the panels and I'm trying to play with and break that structure. And by doing that, instead of just telling the audience how I feel, you can actually see that the page is tilted and like something is not quite right. So. Well, and it seems to me that the page is telling part of the story, too. Exactly. Like the way you put those panel in helps us empathize with how you're feeling. Thank you. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah. Is like that structure of the page is like that helps whoever is reading suture in, especially when you're talking about something that maybe is not fully understood yeah. or like that the audience doesn't have a lot of familiarity with. And that's why that visual is so important. So instead of me it's like having my character say, oh, I feel kind of like funny or like I don't feel like I'm in like the right space. It's like, well, I could just tell you without words via the, uh, the panel borders. Yeah. So. Another undercurrent kind of, and I think you guys are almost raring to talk about this really, is um, the emotions that are related to structure. Because we really talk about structure, um, I think colloquially, like outside of comics, just in the world as it being like kind of this formal and unfriendly thing, as like a, a thing that's imposed upon people who want to be free and creative. And we put that kind of on the opposite side of the spectrum from emotions and all of those things. But it sounds to me, and I, I also definitely feel this way, that structure is like completely entwined with emotions, um, both putting them on the page and producing them for the reader. Um, what are your guys' feelings on that? Mm -hmm. There's a lot, a lot of feelings yeah. about that. Yeah, but I have to like process. You look like you yeah. have to say something. Oh, this is short, but um, structure for me is a target. Um, I already mentioned this like earlier. It's a bottle for where the lightning goes, but like. Um, it's so easy to get overwhelmed. Like any, any younger artist, like you want to draw something, but you don't know exactly what to do, or you might want to make a certain type of mark, um, but you don't know um, you don't know your limitations, or you don't know how to follow up that mark. Structure just gives you um, a little guide, and that's that's kind of how I've been seeing it. I used to see it as this really um, uh, constrictive thing, but I don't know. It's one of those things that hey, uh, it's one of those things that um helps keep me on track. Yeah, totally. I like just had this thought, so I'm going to be working this out as I talk to you guys, so let's hopefully I, I figure this out. Um, but in a lot of, I, obviously I just did a memoir and it's all autobiographical, so I'm thinking now about how my layouts have differed with fiction versus uh, autobiography, and I just had this realization that when I'm putting my own memories on the page, especially e extremely personal and difficult ones, Often the layouts weren't, weren't particularly inventive, but they, they really mattered to the emotion for me because in a way, the layout was my hand. It was me holding my own memories. You know, I, I'm putting the memories on the page, but how I put them in panels and how I put those panels next to each other is an extension of how I hold those memories to myself, if that makes sense. And, I, and it, it is so important to me and to the emotion of the story that that is a part of it because it's, it, yeah, it's, it's me holding the story and me deciding how that story is going to be portrayed, which is so tied to my own memory. And I don't know. Uh, that makes total sense. Yeah. yeah you must. Yeah. This, really, is, yeah, this <laughs> is all like, it's not 100% autobiographical, but like 92%. That is, <laughs> which is still a lot. <laughs> which is an interesting place to work in because like you're right. Like the content of what you're making and like what it means to you does affect those things. And so I'm in an interesting place where like it's mostly nonfiction, but also partially fiction. Like some things are rearranged, characters are changed, so they're not real people, mm -hmm. et cetera. So I, I really glad that you're talking about that because I also had a lot of that thought making this comic about like, you know, how that differs and like how that mental space makes your layouts different. Yeah. So that I makes mean, total sense. Layouts are emotional. I think that's yeah. what we're Yeah, and like on. each of us has our own specific, you know, style of layout and throughout uh, you know, our stories, that layout is going to 
teach you how to read the story mm -hmm. and it will hone you in on, you know, it'll target like emotional points and we all have specific, you know, emotional beats that we need you to hone in on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's important to find kind of like the, not the theme of your work, but the intent of what you're going for mm -hmm. and make sure that all parts of your comic, not just like the art, uh, are, you know, zoning in on that. The layouts are just as important, yeah. Yeah, the whole page is like a cohesive breathing thing, mm -hmm. you know. I don't know about you all, but I, I have never had a, a really intimate conversation about layouts with cartoonists before, and this is really fascinating. <laughs> no, seriously, they're like they're like the behind the scenes thing. You know, they're the they're the people who do the lighting in the show that you never see. It's no one. We're always talking about the story itself. I feel like I'm always talking about that, and I never get a chance to actually talk about the panels and the layouts. I'm just saying this is great. That's all. No, I'm no, it is. And I think it's interesting to have us, all of us here, because um, we're all like very independent in a lot of ways. Like we all like, I think we all do a lot of projects like, with other people or whatever, but we always have like our own thing that we're doing. And when you're doing comics, like indie comics or like comics on your own, you're like, you're doing everything, and there are like some projects where like people do layouts for you, etc. Um, but I have canon to lean on. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. You don't have a canon to lean on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's like interesting for all of us to be talking about this when it's like it's, you know sometimes those jobs get split up, but like when you're doing it by yourself, and comics is really like an all-in-one package. Like uh, those things get more personal, and I think that that page breathes differently. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to tease that out actually, because um. I started out, when I was reading comics, I started out reading Japanese comics. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, looking at art, I was always looking at it as a single person's creation, for the most part, with the exception yeah. of like, I guess, what would the exception be like? Death Note, I guess, right? Um, no, Death Note. Is Death Note the one that's no, two? No, Death Note was one artist and one writer. Right. Yeah, but yeah. That's, that's atypical even though. Like, it's usually one cartoonist and then they do the whole thing, yeah. right? Because like, Kubo does Bleach by himself, God bless him. <laughs> and like, <laughs> and like, you know, it is what it is. But, um, so for me, I was always looking at, for the most part, work as a single thing that was one person's voice. And then when I started reading um, more direct market Western comics when I was like in my late teens, early 20s, um, I A, found that I didn't know how to look at art anymore, at least the way that people were talking about it. People were talking about inkers and layouts and pencils and colors, and I was like, what? <laughs> um, and I think it does, it does come through um, when different people have worked on a, sim a single thing and you get different effects. Um, can you guys talk about any experiences that you've had either working by yourself or maybe working with others in pairs and how that's affected your layout choices if you were responsible for that? Um, I worked on a monthly about two years ago, or 2014, it's called From Under Mountains. It came out from Image Comics. Um, and Marianne Churchland was like doing the covers and then I had a writer, Claire Gibson. Um, and it was like my first like foray into like mainstream comics and uh, Marion started doing like layouts for me and uh, if anyone's familiar with her work she just has she has very pared down layouts like three panels two panels and just like really beautiful like illustrious um, drawings um, for me I don't draw like really as like elegantly as she does and my I kind of favor like hard, dirty inks and like zoning in on like emotional beats. Um, and the way she paneled was like, just like not how I panel. <laughs> so when I was trying to plug my art into her layouts, it looked horrible. <laughs> um, so I had to, she's like, okay, you know what? You, you just do like your own layouts and it was way better. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. That's interesting. It just didn't work together. Mm -mm. That mm -hmm. happens. Yeah. 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 There's no really, there's no avoiding that. I think, you know, it's always going to there's always going to be an experience where it's like, you know, you've, we're all talking about our different styles of layouts here, and it's like, you know. I guess I haven't worked with enough people to know that. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of weird for me because I, I almost resist, not, not willingly, but um, I guess my approach kind of resists um, people suggesting layout. Well, maybe not suggesting layouts. I'm open to suggestions. But, like, if someone writes for me and they give me, uh, they give me like, panels to draw, I'll always find a way to draw that more, either more economically or like, um, either more economically or completely differently. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I've always been kind of resistant to that. So is yeah. that? Do you feel like you need to like put yourself into your layouts? Is that? I mean, um, I wonder where that instinct comes from. It's like the best way I can describe it is when a cat like starts needing a surface to lay <laughs> yes, on. Making so, so stuff is going to get rearranged. 
<laughs> so yeah, before I can get comfortable. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know how like colors play into layout that much. It's probably maybe too into the art side of things, but that can really matter can, though. Yeah. Oh no, they matter a lot. Um, those control pacing. It can totally jack up your layouts. Like you may have like paneled something in a way that like hones in on one beat that's like in the first panel, and then the way that it's colored is just like oh, my focus is going down to the bottom right corner, yeah. complete opposite. So. I'm really OCD about, like, say I have a page and it's all blue and I have a yellow accent color. This sounds a lot like on a sunbeam. Um, if I put yellow as an accent in the upper right-hand corner, I have to also put it in the lower left-hand corner to balance it out. Like, I imagine my page often as, like, a weight of, of, like, a scale with two sides. And if I put it here, it has to be somewhere on the other side or it just feels unbalanced. But then sometimes you want... Like the reader, to, you want the reader to feel unbalanced, so I guess it goes yeah. both ways. Yeah, I think like a, an interesting, like basic tenant of layout and color and ink call kind of working together is like, um, like a very like comics one on one thing is like solid blacks will lead the eye. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you have a lot of solid blacks, uh, like in your backgrounds or in your characters or whatever, like that is where the eye is going to go, and that helps you lay out the page while also considering uh, the drawings at the same time and kind of making it a cohesive thing. Right. Yeah. Chris, I know you had some comics that you wanted to talk about a little bit. So. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so I guess we have to rewind a little bit further um, to, I guess, what got me into comics. Um, it was always uh, it was always super emotional for me, but the type of emotion was always this uh, explosive moment, typically in shonen um, manga, that explosive moment or like that that end of arc punch, um, <laughs> shouts out One Piece, um, <laughs> or that, uh, yeah, I have an image, um, the actual 21 one? Oh, actually, yeah, I'll go oh, back to that one. Do you want Actually. You want this one? Yeah, yes. yeah. All right. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> so good. Yeah. Um, so good. Just like, I gotta get up for this one. Um, yeah, do it, do it, do it. So just to be careful, because the mic is the only way that people can hear you f if we take the video. Okay. So. Can y'all hear me? Alright, so, so yeah, just looking at the way, like, okay, this is how I learned comics, by reading stuff like this and watching how, uh, paying attention how I experience uh, the eye being led and also how the camera might be distorted on a panel. Um, it, it, really, it really taught me to get loose, and yeah, I, I've kind of been chasing feelings like that since I got into comics. So yeah. Yeah. I feel like getting loose is like a really important thing. You have to learn it. You yeah. know, it's a really strange, but like you really have to learn how to unwind. And I think this particular artist who does Ice Shield and One Punch Man is like a really good example because not only does he like loosen up with his layouts, he also takes lettering into account. I think this page is a great example where he just he leads the layout with the lettering, and there are certain parts I think in One Punch Man where he tilts the lettering as well and tilts it with the layout. So he's always playing with that kind of stuff. Well, look at the rumble. The rumble's like leading you down. Yeah, it's really cool. I, uh, I, I, I mean, obviously, I think most of us here have been influenced by manga. That's, uh, that's not a stretch yeah. to say that. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I do think that because I read manga at a young age, I always sort of deep down knew that layouts could be played with. Mm -hmm. Like, you st we, I still had to go through a process of learning to do that myself, but because what influenced me, I saw stuff like this, I always knew that there was potential in layouts, but I think sometimes people who maybe grow up with more Western comics maybe don't see this as much. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's interesting that you bring up that effect because um, it's like, it's like, if you start off seeing someone do the hardest thing, you think that that's the standard. But, um, and just like, I, I also started off with manga and like looking at Western comics, um, that's when I learned about the grid, maybe like 10, 15 years later. And I was like, oh, this is where you start to think like that. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite like layout artists is this mangaka called um, Keiko Takamiya. She does Towards Terra. And literally every single page of her like, of this one series, it's like seven volumes, I want to say. Which series? Towards Terra. Um, it's, I think it's three massive volumes of the version I okay. have, but it's really long. Yeah, yeah, it's super long, and it's like every single page is a different layout, and it's amazing. And you will, you can just like 
copy like every single page if you wanted to and never come across the same layout and it's applicable to like each scene uh, it's beautiful yeah and she writes like very emotional like sci-fi yes um and it all works very well in her layouts i'm always super impressed yeah. <laughs> they're all so cool yeah do you is that Ke- keiko takamiya yeah. yes okay do y'all ever steal layouts? Not steal, but do you ever yep. learn <laughs> from layouts? Because I do that sometimes. Uh, it's uh, yeah. called influence. Yeah. yeah. No, especially when I was learning, like, oh my god. Hmm. Well, I was just like at the Jefferson Building the other day, and I was looking at these old like Mayan like carvings, and there is literally like an interesting four-panel comic carved onto a jaguar bone. Oh my god! Of this dude getting his like uh, penis perforated. That was a comic, and it was. Four literal panels, and I was like, this is sick. (laughs) So, yeah. So, I think this is a good point to transition. Um, (laughs) Perfect. So, two things. Firstly, um, we'll take the last 15 minutes to do questions. If you want to ask a question, you should go to one of the mics on either side. Um, So, while you guys are doing that and figuring out if you want to ask a question, we'll just do a quick fast break just straight down the table. Who are you, probably your biggest one or two influences for layouts, and why? So, we'll start with Tilly. Oh my. Um, I'll do one Western, one Japanese. Uh, Japanese Yoshihiro Togashi, uh, Yu Yu Hakusho, Hunter x Hunter. Um, I. My, my jacket. <laughs> my jacket. Really? Oh my god, I need to talk to you. Um, <laughs> after this, about your jacket. Um, yeah, just the way he drew motion, the way. I don't know, maybe it's just because it was the first manga that I really got into. It just blew my mind and still influences me to this day. And then a Western. Cartoonist uh, David Small, who did Stitches, it's a graphic memoir. Um, that was the first time I saw really open layouts, and rather than drawing panels, he just used the edges of watercolor to to be the panel. And that that I think those influences together really kind of helped me find my own uh, style. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Um, besides like tons of like Jose and like shoujo, shoujo manga. Um, uh, a contemporary artist right now is Michelle Fife, who's mm-hmm. got like a new book out called Zegas, and then he does something called Copra, another series. Um, and his layouts are just like super sick, also in the vein of like manga, of just like super expressive and impressionistic. And he also takes advantage of like line texture and thickness and weight, and yeah, super, super good. What was the name of the series? Uh, Copra, C O P R A, and then the new book that's out today is Zegas, Z E G A S, yeah. Oh my oh. Yeah. Go buy it. <laughs> um, if you're familiar with manga, you probably know the name Osama Tezuka. <laughs> and uh, there's a million reasons why you should read Osama Tezuka, right? I yes. <laughs> see so you nodding over there. A, l- a little indie, a little indie fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Super um, yeah, underground. God. Yeah, literally like the god. Um, and like that's just one of the reasons why is because his layouts really taught me a lot about what um, some people call synesthetic visuals, and that means like we're talking about the page being a breathing thing. Thing and the page no. like being uh, like, a, like a cohesive image. Um, his work is all about that, and it's not just the panels. It's literally every aspect of pretty much every comic he does is just so cohesive. And in particular, I'd recommend uh, the Phoenix series, which oh is oh my god, I love it's Phoenix called so like it basically uh, is his magnum opus, and that for me is a huge influence. And in not only is like everything Tezuka does like an influence for me in every way, but the layouts in particular are a really important part of his work. Yeah, um, Taiyo Matsumoto is huge, like I'm super into uh, uh, ping pong, like looking at ping pong whenever I need to get going. Um, actually, I have an example. Do you have ping pong? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, there yes. we go. Yes! Yeah, seriously. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, Taiyo Matsumoto, uh, he, the way he plays with layouts obviously is like super emotional, super kinetic. Um, everything, a lot of things that I want to do, um, I guess, like shooting off of him would be um, Bastien Vives. V- Vive? Oh, Vive? Yeah, mm-hmm. he does Last Man. Um, uh, he's also really, like, heavily inspired by um, Matsumoto. And you really? can see, well, you can, you can kind of see the lineage. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I just never knew that. Yeah, um, and let's see, uh, what else? Um, I guess, as far as, like, Western artists go, I like. I've been reading Don't Come In Here by Patrick Kyle. Um, you might be able to find it here today. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, a lot of the comic is just like one, two, like two panels per page. And it's like super long, but it's also a really smooth read. It actually, in a lot of ways, feels like you're reading a Shonen Jump or something. 
Um, but the, like that's not the story. But uh, he does such a great job establishing uh, rhythm and uh, stuff like that. I kind of pay attention to. It's like reading comics on a grid. Um, kind of feels like beat making, where like you you want to lay down your percussions before you like freestyle. So mm. yeah, that's where I'm at. Questions from the audience? You got one taker at least, good. <laughs> Don't be shy. First one, always very brave. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, uh, hi. wow, that's not, okay. Hi, uh, Chris, you said something a couple of times that I'd, I'd like to hear more about. So we've heard a lot about how layouts can, in like um, more abstract or relaxed or open layouts can communicate an emotion. But at the beginning, you said that you find a freedom to control emotion in the grid, and then you just talked about the grid being like the beat for you to freestyle on top of. So I was wondering if you could talk more about how you how you use the grid to fine tune and control that emotion. Oh sure. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, I took Frank Santoro's comics correspondence course a couple years ago, and um, I think the biggest takeaway from that course was thinking of comics like he he put it like think of comics like jazz. You know, you want to keep your beat. Um, and use the grid as a metronome. And so in doing that, I know where I want my, um, where I want my uh, emotional impact or where I want my beat to exist on the page. Um, so say if uh, I have a six panel grid, uh, the third panel might be where I want to uh, put a beat or like have a special moment or a change in scene or emotion. Or um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, um, it's it's a lot simpler than it sounds, and um, also I don't know much about music, which is I don't know. Uh, it's really <laughs> weird that I bring up like a jazz analogy, and I know nothing about music, but it makes sense to me. <laughs> so yeah, it's like keeping count, um, using the grid, and um, knowing like using those beats to lay down your moments, and then you kind of build from there, like kind of flesh it out from there, in between those beats. I do like a lot of like inset panels and like I did a page recently for the sci-fi comic and it was just like three three tiers of just one panel each and then I did like a whole a little inset panel on the side that was basically just like a whole another page that had like eight panels in it and there's like a tiny there's like a sequence going on like kind of like off the scene but that it was still crucial for you to see that happening so I don't know. It's kind of hard. It, I I do like like a musical analogy because it is very about rhythm, but also it's just it's so much its own thing. It's very hard to like yeah. find the perfect like comparison. So yeah. Like it's a mixture between intuition and emotion, but also like there's a weird logic to it. And yeah. Yeah. Comics is an instrument. Yeah. Cool. I always think about with the grid that one of the biggest powers of it is using a grid. You know, you use a grid for. 10 pages and you don't change it at all and it establishes kind of this baseline and then on the last page you change it and that that is always that always causes an emotional reaction not only because maybe something's happening in your story but just as human beings if we like get used to something we're like oh this is so nice and comforting and then you change it and it's like ah you know you don't know what to do um more stability yeah no exactly it's it's about stability um so i i think about that with the grid okay. questions i wonder uh, if you can talk about how you as individual artists approach borders on panels. Uh, like for instance, I notice in, in this example, there's a little thin amount of white space in between each of the borders. Um, doing that versus filling that space in, or, um, or for instance, in the top right panel, having the striated lines on the top and bottom. Um, how do you make those choices when you're drawing? Uh, manga has a pretty like solid rule of like, uh, Horizontal lines um, should be horizontal. Uh, should be a little bit wider, yeah. and then vertical lines are skinnier. Um, and but that depends because sometimes I want like a fat gap between horizontal stuff if I need I don't know for just like weird narrative reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so it just kind of depends on like the movement and like the speed of your story and yeah, compression yeah. and all that. I, I learned uh, that basically the space in between uh, the panels horizontally can convey time. And so the longer, or like the, uh, I'm sorry? Like this way? Yeah, oh, so okay. if you have space uh, in between your rows of panels, that helps convey longer beats of time. The closer they are together, um, it doesn't always have to be this way, but it tends to generally uh, help the reader think, oh, some time has passed. 
So I think we're really kind of on the same the same page yeah. with that. <laughs> I've never heard that, but that's awesome. <laughs> Any more questions? You got one over here? I really want to see the, uh, the Phoenix series get reprinted again so we can get a hold of it. Oh, my God. Yeah. Too, um, I had a question for you when you were talking about goods and how that kind of restricts um, that really restricts and focuses your vision kind of within comics. Do you all have any, like, when you're starting out on a blank piece of paper, do you have any parameters or restrictions that you kind of put in your own way that's personally that you kind of have, like, as a starting point and you sort of put quotes like number of panels per page? I don't know. I just kind of, you know, kind of throwing it out there just kind of with a starting point of any sort of like personal parameters you might put in yourself when it comes to layouts. Um, I've been doing this late. I've been doing this lately, where um, I would give myself a set number of panels, and even if I end up like buffing the entire grid for a comic, um, I would want to start with something just so I can get images down. Either that, or I'll just like draw on separate um, index cards and then kind of figure out where they all go after I establish something. But I, I think um, starting out, I would adhere to structure just so I can start drawing. Um, I think that everyone's different. I think my answer to that question would be no. Um, yeah. I, it's basically, it just really varies from page to page to page. And like, again, everybody works differently, but for me, um, when I'm approaching a page, it's a blank canvas and whatever is gonna go on there is gonna be completely different from you know, whatever else. And it's its own being. So I tend to just not put any restrictions and focus mainly on like what needs to be said. Yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah. I uh, actually in the past have really struggled with picking layouts because sometimes it's felt so fast that I, I like, you know, a, a lot of people thumbnail their comics before they draw them and so you're like drawing it in a tiny version to try and figure out what it's going to look like. And I, I've always struggled with that process and I found this very bizarre method to pick layouts and it's that I will thumbnail a comic and pick completely random layouts that have nothing to do with my story and then try and force the story into that. And then when I realize it doesn't fit, I change it. And so by giving myself, you know, like two panels on the top, three in the middle, and two on the bottom, I'll like try drawing a page like that. And I'm like, oh, well, this doesn't work at all. I need a bigger panel here. I need this there. And that's how I find my layout. But I find starting with a blank page is often a little overwhelming because it's so blank and there's so many possibilities. And so by giving myself, it's as if someone, it's as if someone is sending me layouts and I'm saying, I disagree with this, but I have to do it myself. Yeah. You need to, you need to, you need to be your own like harsh editor. Yeah. 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 Any more questions for anybody? Looks like we got one. Hi. So you guys were talking about how in color, when it comes to color, it leads the eye to places you may not have intended in your comics. So do you recommend starting out with black and white comics first and then working your way, or do you have any more tips on that kind of stuff? Um, when I was in art school, uh, I had an illustration professor that, and this was mainly about illustration, but I figured this, um, not figure, but like this obviously translated over in the comics, but black and white, one color. If you want, if you want to start incorporating color in uh, black and white comics, then find out where that one color goes on the page, and then you'll start thinking more about intent. And then um, once you once you figure that out, you'll start um, learning about how you can keep that uh, focal, yeah, keep that focal color, and then like continue to build color around it. So that that's helped out a bunch. Yeah, I think starting with black and white is good, and I actually favor black and white comics despite being a colorist for a long time and like <laughs> using crazy colors. Uh, it's just easier to learn about clarity and composition through black and white. Um, and then once you add color, it's the same thing about comp composition, but there's also like a, just like a emotional element to colors that will play with your perception, um, like per putting like purple and orange side by side um, almost makes it vibrate to the eye. So there's a lot of other weird elements that you kind of have to take into account. So if you're starting out, yeah, black and white is probably great to learn, but don't be afraid of color. Yeah. I think I, I learned by basically doing black and white, then by incorporating one color, then two, then three, and then I stopped caring and did whatever I wanted. But I think one, two, and three color comics all may have different challenges, but you could, they teach you so much by yeah. doing all those different mm -hmm. kinds. So by building your, build your way out to it, full color is like a whole thing that I still don't really get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got time for one last question. No? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, so I just want to ask a question coming from a writing perspective, uh, since I, don't, I can't draw. Uh, but just in terms of sending uh, scripts over to, to artists, what I normally do in my scripts is I'm very open with it because I want to give the artist as much space to, to work as possible. Um, but what I'm trying to do more is impart a lot more of the emotional uh, context of what's going on and the psychological context of things that are going on. Um, so I was just wondering, let's just say you were the writer and you were sending something to another artist. What is something you would do from a layout perspective to kind of get across certain things that you want in there without saying specifically, because I never specifically say, it has to look like this, you have to do it like this. I'll say there's five panels on a page, so however you want to arrange it is fine. Um, but just so that you're not losing certain things that you might have in mind as a writer, uh, but still giving them the freedom to do what they want to do in terms of the art. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, back in school, I saw, I got to see one of Mike Miola's scripts for Hellboy, and um, I don't think he was drawing it at the time, but uh, it was just like, this particular script page was numbered one through five, and it was just things that Hellboy was doing on that page. It was like, he falls in the hole, he sees a skeleton, the skeleton is like, what's up? And then, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it kind of goes through that, but it's like super open to interpretation. Um, and the most important thing, um, you can kind of assume that the, numbered, the numbers will be panels, but um, the most important takeaway from that is that each of those things are separate events that have to have its own space. So yeah, um, I think thinking about thinking about like those micro beats like that really helps you uh, convey how you want the layout to go. So, yeah. Yeah, I really like a, a Matt Fraction's way of writing for his artists. Um, I I'm not a big fan of writers like dictating panels like panel one. This happens because it just. It doesn't always look right on the page, especially if the writer doesn't um, maybe do the layout beforehand, like sketch it out and do a thumb and like actually double check that it makes sense. Um, instead, just like describing that, okay, this this emotional beat of like this guy punching this guy needs to take up, like have the most impact on the page, and then letting the artist kind of work around that, I feel like is a kind of better way to translate what you want to an artist. But it really, it just depends on the artist and your relationship with them. Yeah, I think being open is the best way to go. Um, like, work closely with your artist, and like, if they need more structure, like, help them out. But um, if I can get literary for a second, uh, one of my favorite uh, playwrights and authors is Tennessee Williams. And Tennessee Williams, in his scripts, made a point of like giving stage directions, but not getting overly detailed. And that means that every production of a play would be slightly different, because he would put really important details in, but wouldn't put everything in. So I think when I think about writers and like scripting out for artists, that's kind of what I think is like give the basics and like what really needs to be conveyed. But from there on, like make sure that production stands out in its own way. Yeah, and like. I don't know, I feel like when you work with an artist, you just want them to do them and do what they're good at and just like giving them the freedom to do that. Because I know when I have done scripts with like the layout pretty like ironed out and finished and that's what they want, I'm just like, okay, and I'm just like plugging in these images and it kind of like takes away from like the pleasure of doing it and kind of like the life of it. Right. Um, so that's just my experience, but yeah. Or you could go on the exact opposite. Have, has anyone read Bakuman here? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, the writer, the writer would actually draw um, a really crude version of the comic, and um, yes, and, and like work with the artist directly, and then the artist will figure out that. Um, so don't be afraid to like get your hands dirty and draw. Like you yeah. might not be able, you might not have the same training, but you still have the taste. You still have like the ability to draw borders so yeah. Yeah. yeah all right i think that's it i want to thank all the panelists um, for coming and joining us yeah.